Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm the uh, CG president, Jesse Sharkey. Um, we're um, having a pre quick press conference tonight. We just got done with our House of Delegates meeting, uh, which voted overwhelmingly 63 to 37 uh, to suspend the remote work action, which we've been involved in. Um, actually, it was a lockout. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what got us here, um, what's in this agreement, and what we see coming next. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and then we'll be taking some questions, of course. Uh, I, I guess just to, to begin, um, I'm personally exhausted and glad this is over. This has been a, a very unpleasant experience. Um, uh, the CTU felt like we were uh, asking for a set of reasonable things. Um, obviously, as teachers who've been in buildings since the beginning of the school year, um, who've been teaching, uh, have been doing clinical work, uh, providing IP services, uh, working with um, our neediest children, uh, PSRPs, uh, our clinicians and, and teachers, of course. Um, we have been dealing with uh, increasingly difficult conditions as positivity rates rose and as the pandemic developed over the course of the fall. Uh, this was, it hasn't been easy, but we've been in there in our schools every day, uh, making the education system work. During this period of time, the, the memorandum of agreement, the, the safety agreement, if you will, that we had negotiated uh, previously um, uh, during last winter expired. And so we, we spent hundreds of hours at a bargaining table with the Board of Ed trying to get a new one. Uh, and we did that um, not so much because we were in an acute situation right there, but because we realized that this pandemic, you know, if we've learned anything from it, is that there's a bunch of unexpected stuff and, and that uh, there's kind of a constant threat as this virus mutates and, and we uh, in school have to deal with all the threats that it represents. Um, and when I say hundreds of sessions, I, I, I literally mean we, we around the clock for, for months, uh, met all through the summer uh, and all through the fall. It became clear to us that the Board of Ed didn't really want to bargain with us uh, about a lot of the key safety features that we thought we needed. And I'll give an example about that. Um, the board made a testing program, the testing program that it had last year, it didn't continue, um, which was really a testing program for the alpha variant. It was it was extremely minimal. And um, we were we were as you know, as early as June, we're saying you you should get a more robust testing program. What we can't really expect uh, this just to continue the way it is. Um, so, something could happen. Then the Delta variant came and we, we saw it coming. Um, you know, at first it was surging in the South and, and CPS didn't even like go out and try to get a vendor to set up a new testing program until the summer was virtually over. And so we began the, the, the year with a, uh, the school year with a promise that we were going to have 100% of the students who wanted to be tested would be tested. And we didn't even get to a point where we had testing in every school until 10 months into the school year. Uh, and that had some very real and, and really some very dangerous consequences. It meant that we were never really able to screen people or do a robust testing program. And so we wound up with dangerous outbreaks in a number of schools. We had an outbreak in, in Jensen School, for example, uh, on the west side where two parents died. We had a, we had an outbreak at the Carnegie School um, where a staff member, a guy who started to become a special education teacher, Janelle Bush, um, uh, tragically um, passed away, it, you know, et cetera. And so, you know, we, we we began to have an increasing sense of foreboding in which like we did not have confidence in, you know and the board all the time was telling us things were safe and we were watching the impact of, of COVID among our students and their families in particular. Teachers were, were, were vaccinated uh, you know for the most part um, over 90 percent and so I don't think our members felt personal say uh, so their, their personal safety was it was at risk, but it was definitely the case that we felt that the safety of our families and the people who are dedicated to in the schools were at risk. And we were raising increasing alarm. I actually went to every single board of education meeting in the fall and said exactly this, which is that like we're watching cases increase. We're aware of the dangers in the situation. Uh, we do not have proper safety mitigations in place. And I remember the last one, I said, I'm not going to be the frog that doesn't jump out of the boiling pot of water um, as the heat is turned up on it. And this is exactly what happened, which is that, you know, with the, with the Omicron variant emerged um, in late November and, and came fast, it came to a school system that did not have either the trust nor the mitigation um, nor the operations in place to deal with it properly. Uh, and so when we were bargaining with the board over winter break, uh, it was just, it, it, they just basically said it's impossible for us to do all the things that you're asking. And they made it seem as if it somehow it was our fault for asking they either adopt widespread safety measures or take a short-term temporary pause to remote in order to get their act together. And 
um, you know, that, that's extremely disappointing. And, you know, and I, I know that we have seen uh, the mayor and others with a narrative that somehow, um, you, you know, the, the uh, you know, our demands for, for, for better, better mitigations for testing, for metrics that would flip a school to remote, for decent quality masks, for all the things that we, that we know we need, um, that those things should be in place. Um, but that's not the way that went down. So I, I um, and, you know, and, and what you saw take, you know, roll out, take place over the last week or so in Chicago, I think was a direct result of, um, you know, what was really a, a, a callous uh, disregard for what, you know, and, and pre a predictable result of um, what we saw coming a long way out. And so I'm tired. Uh, I wish it hadn't gone that way. Um, ultimately, I'm very proud of the fact that the members of the Chicago Teachers Union took a stand around this. Um, and um, we're, we're going to keep doing what's right as we go forward in the city. Um, you know, it was not an agreement that had everything. It's not a perfect agreement, um, but it's something that we, that we can hold our heads up about, um, partly because it was so difficult to get. Um, it does include some important things, um, which are going to help safeguard ourselves in our schools. And um, uh, we, we look forward to continuing to keep our members united uh, and continuing to do the work to serve the people of the city um, and, and, and children of Chicago. Thanks. So look, you all, um, the Chicago Teachers Union, once again, in this pandemic has had to create infrastructure for safety and accountability in our school communities. This is the second January in a row where we have had to be held hostage, quite frankly, um, in hostage negotiations. Because like, let's be clear, whenever a mayor and her doctor tell you that a place is safe, that you are experiencing the lack of safety, they have made a determination about what they won't do. We heard the mayor CEO tell us that they never intended to provide an agreement, that they never intended to provide us with a metric. Thereby, we started this process at ground zero after struggling last January and last February to create infrastructure and a mechanism that would keep us safe, right? And so what we saw last Wednesday, last Thursday, last Friday, the weekend and today were your teachers <laughs> that continuously are demonized for respecting humanity. Teachers, paraprofessionals, clinicians, tech coordinators that sacrifice their livelihood, support to their families, in order to make this city and our school district better. Chicago owes them a debt of gratitude for that because without them, you don't get a metric in your schools. However imperfect this metric is, because it is, we have one. You have more testing because the mayor was shamed into taking the testing from the governor who, by the way, offered it months ago. We have better contact tracing because it will be anchored inside of our school communities where we have agency over how to make it work well. What parents don't know is that without the, the, the workers, the school workers in your building, you don't have anything. This mayor is unfit to lead this city and she is on a one woman kamikaze mission to destroy our public schools. She has not taken good care over the safety of the workers and the students that attended. She leverages black and brown students when she is fighting, but she ain't implementing anything in that building that looks like a plan of safety. This agreement is the only modicum of safety that is available for anyone that steps foot in the Chicago public school, especially in the places in the city where testing is low and where vaccination rates are low. I'm gonna to speak directly to parents because I'm a parent. Thank you teachers. Thank you paraprofessionals. Because because of them, they have more to go back into those school communities with. Beyond that, 
You have to ask the mayor to begin a better relationship, not just with the Chicago Teachers Union, but a better relationship with the truth, a better relationship with how you relate to your responsibility or her responsibility as the steward of this city. This should have never gotten this far. We had to walk, we had to, hmm, we had to go on a remote action for face coverings in the middle of a pandemic. We had to go on a remote action to get more testing inside of our school communities in the middle of a pandemic. She fought us every step of the way and now she behaves as if it's a victory that we get to survive. Think about that for a minute. So I wanna lift up my members. I wanna lift up their families and I wanna appreciate the sacrifice that they continue to make for this city to make it better and to give our students what they deserve. Jan, can you please unpack some of this uh, agreement? Absolutely. Um, we've been at the table six months and we've set very clear bars for what we were looking for. And many of the aspects of what we've been seeking are in agreements um, around around the nation. Um, what we were able to secure, I think, speaks to what Stacy is lifting up, which is the lived experience of educators and students and families in our schools. And this agreement moves toward what they've been asking for for a long time, even if it doesn't get all the way that we think we should have. Um, testing will significantly increase in schools based on this agreement. Um, we've been asking for opt out testing. The mayor would not agree to opt out testing, but what this agreement does do is set um, a, a goal of having quick ramp up to uh, a true screening testing program whereby at least 10% of students in every school are tested on a weekly basis. We have uh, a couple hundred schools that have languished with low test consents this entire beginning of the school year. So we, we know we're undercounting COVID in our schools. I and mean, we know that that's why some of our school communities have had to take um, action, um, try to, to, to push for safety and why our members took this action. So the screening testing program um, will be buttressed by efforts to increase opt-out that our members honestly have been offering to participate in um, since the beginning of the school year. There will be concrete um, stipends for folks to do some of that work. Um, there will be paid hourly work after school for um, staff and our members to help assist get signups. Um, there will also be additional rapid tests available in schools, in care rooms, so that symptomatic students can be tested on the spot. Um, and and uh, there will continue to be testing of staff and students in schools. Schools that had higher rates of testing um, in December will maintain their level of testing. So this agreement does not undercut existing testing. It, it adds to additional testing. Um, we are asking our members to help tomorrow in phone banking um, our families and in order to um, get testing up and running um, towards this uh, real screening program, which is something we should have had in place, which, which is something that many other districts do. Um, another key to this agreement um, was under what conditions would individual school communities pause temporarily for five to 10 days and go to remote? We know there have been outbreaks and uh, levels of COVID in our school communities, particularly the ones that Stacy described in school communities that serve black students where vaccination rates are lower, where families have been hit hard by COVID, where the trauma and the loss is extraordinarily real. Um, members at Jensen, Carnegie, and Park Manor have been saying this, um, some of them for months and some of them for weeks, um, that, that they needed some measure of protection. So prior to this agreement, there was absolutely no metric which would have flipped an individual school to remote. This agreement provides a flip to remote while we're in high transmission of COVID according to the CDC's community transmission rates when 40% uh, of students are in isolation or quarantine. And it also provides that when 50% of students are in isolation of quarantine other in other time periods in this pandemic, a school could, could flip to remote. Additionally, there are provisions for when 30% of staff test positive or have COVID um, and, that, and that rate of uh, absence causes the overall absence rate of, of teachers uh, to go to 25%, even with substitutes that a school community could flip to remote. You know, we've been fighting to have these provisions that, you know, if the school is understaffed, and if all if so many of the children are in quarantine, it does not make sense to, to, to run school. It's not going to be safe. We, you know, these are not the exact metrics that we would want to hit, but it provides some safeguard 
um, going forward, particularly as we're still um, seeing what happens in this current surge. Um, we believe um, that the metrics would have prevented some of the um, most dire situations, particularly in um, elementary schools, in underserved communities, in black neighborhoods where vaccination still remains too low. Um, additionally, you know, CPS did commit um, to additional KN95 masks for both staff and students. And I want to be clear, we've been asking for students the whole time. Um, I will say that we've already, you know, experienced some skepticism from our members around um, them being able to distribute. So we need to, to see some accountability. We need to see those KN95s distributed um, as immediately um, so that staff and students who need them can access them. But that is a commitment in this agreement. Um, and then the last one that I will highlight, there are other components, but the last one I will highlight is the contact tracing component of this agreement. Our members um, have said for months that contact tracing is slow, that the notifications lag, or that sometimes people who they think should be contacted are not contacted. And we, and we want to have um, confidence in the contact tracing program, because that's really what creates our ability to um, address um, exposing people who have been exposed to the virus. Um, and so, you know, we've said this for months, this, you know, CPS has said we hired enough tracers, but that's, that's not the experience, the lived experience of the, the families and the parents and the staff in schools. This agreement allows that every school will have a, a contact tracing team where our members and staff are able to be paid in order to do contact tracing work. So we think it will dramatically increase the number of people participating in the process. But more importantly, these individuals would be doing contact tracing for student cases in their own school community. They know the staff, they know the, the students, they will have a much better time making connections, getting the information, um, and sharing it appropriately, right? Respecting um, students and families' confidentiality is appropriate. But we think this is a critical uh, shift um, to bringing some of that contact tracing to the school level, where the people who are experts um, in what's happening in the school are participants and contributing to the process and being paid for their work. Um, so I'm sure we'll, we'll take some questions later. Um, there's other components, but I'd say those are kind of the really key um, parts of this agreement. Thanks, um, Jen, and um, thanks, Stacey. Um, 